Thank you for coming. Fantastic turnout, I'm really pleased. Welcome to Theodore Jorgensen Hall, new home of the Department of Physics and Astronomy. I'm Dan Clays, a high energy physicist. High energy physicists collect and analyze data from those gigantic experiments like the ones conducted at Fermilab National Laboratory outside of Chicago or the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland. Yes, to the conspiracy theorists among you, I might well be one of those madmen who through arrogance, stupidity, or outright carelessness may well endanger the Earth by the creation of a mini black hole. My God, that sounds like one of the supervillains that the people I'm going to talk about have to fight each and every day. I hope to have some fun with you in the next hour, but I'm certainly not trying to make fun of the comic books. I have loved them ever since I was a little kid. And although they may not have inspired me to become a physicist, I often think that the scientific explanation for their origin or the source of their powers or often the scientific sleight of hand, the trick by which they've vanquished the villains, at least always made me think from an early start that science could be cool. When Superman debuted in Action Comics number one, his ability to fly was explained as jumping with super strength. And in that first issue, they claimed he could leap over a 40-story building or jump an eighth of a mile. Or, as it was explained in the show in syndication that kept me glued to the television set every afternoon, faster than a speeding bullet, more powerful than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. All attributed to the fact that he's an alien. He was born on a planet where a human-like race had evolved under the influence of an enormous gravity. In arguing that he could leap over a 40-story building, the creators of Superman certainly must have had the equitable building in mind. By then, it was already a well-established landmark and was, in fact, 40 stories tall, 437 feet. Let's compare that with the peak of human perfection back here on Earth. Uh, the Olympic record is something just under five and a half feet. Superman can jump 10 times as high as an Olympic human athlete. Uh, just for comparison purposes, NBA player can clear about a meter, meter and a half, almost up to two meters in a single vertical leap. To clear 537 feet, physics gives us a formula for calculating the speed you would need to leave the surface of the Earth with to make it that far. The formula, all it asks for is to find the speed or velocity, square root of two times. The factor G is the acceleration due to gravity, the rate at which things fall near our surface on Earth you know it is 32 feet per second squared, or in the metric terms, 9.8 meters per second squared. That's g, the acceleration due to gravity, and then h, the height you hope to achieve. So be able to jump that high, you got to leave the ground at something close to 125 miles an hour. If you leave with 125 miles an hour, you of course slow down under the influence of gravity, but you won't slow down to a stop until you've reached 537 feet. Now, how is that achieved? Superman, remember, leaps in a single bound. He's got to apply a force against the ground to raise himself up and accelerate at that rate. He's got to be able to push against the ground faster than he does just to hold his own weight steady on the surface. He's got to provide himself with an acceleration that, over the distance that he moves while still pushing on the ground, because as soon as his feet leave the ground, he's no longer pushing. So he must have done all of his acceleration in that short distance. So from some position like this to some position like that, your center of mass boosts up about 3 quarters of a meter, 72 centimeters or so. To achieve that speed, 
with only that much distance, the acceleration you'd need comes now from this formula. Plugging in how far he moves and the final speed he hopes to achieve requires an acceleration over 2,000 meters per second squared. Let me go back to that formula, rearrange it slightly. Then the force that would be required to give Superman that speed will come from this calculation. The M in that calculation is supposed to be the mass of Superman. We know the mass of Superman because in the movie Superman 1, Lois Lane interviews him and asks him, how much do you weigh? And he says, 225 pounds. 225 pounds is 102 kilometers of mass. So he needs to leap by pressing against the surface with about 50,000 pounds of force. By the way, following crisis after infinite crisis, those that follow the DC universe the last 10, 15 years know that Superman has been reinvented so many times, they keep rebooting his origin, that they've added more rationale for where some of his powers come from. The heat vision, the x-ray vision, telescopic vision. Some of his abilities come from the fact that he is now in a planet where there's a yellow sun overhead and absorbing the higher energy spectrum of the yellow sun enhances those other powers. And yet, in the repeated reboots, they still have him leaping with super strength. In the 1980s, John Byrne re boot is Superman. There's clearly a scene where Clark Kent is revealing his secret to Lana Lang. And he does it, John Byrne drew it spectacularly, focusing on his calf muscles so that he just springs on his toes and he shoots up into the clouds. By the way, 50,000 pound force against the ground is also completely, cons I calculated that using the fact that he can achieve a 537 foot height but it's the same force would give him an eighth of a mile range as well. So those two numbers are completely consistent. And you can compare that to how far an ordinary human can jump. Of course, on his home planet, were it still existing, he'd be able to push just as hard to leap off of the surface. But the whole point is, back on Krypton, he'd push that hard, but he'd look like he's an ordinary human leaping at unspectacular levels. He'd leave the ground at just six meters per second. It'd carry him, you know, a meter or two up off of the ground, that's it. He'd accelerate only 25 meters per second squared in the process, and this motion would take human reaction time of about a quarter of a second. So everything would seem pretty human. I could go back now and look at the formula that I used to determine the force required for him to leap to his astounding distances here on Earth. And the main difference is he could have pushed just as hard. That F would be the same. His mass is the same. But now the G, which formerly was occupied by that for the Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared, would be a much larger value, whatever it is on Krypton. Well, since I know all of the numbers except for that little G, I can figure out what it must have been on Krypton. And the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Krypton must have been 461 meters per second squared. That's almost 50 times, 47, times the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. In other words, the planet Krypton must have had a force of gravity 47 times stronger than you and I experience here on the surface of the Earth. What does that maybe tell us about the planet Krypton? Um, different from Earth in what way, do you think? Okay, got to be bigger, right? But as soon as you raise the question bigger, I can come right back at you and ask bigger in what way? Is it its girth, how big around it is, its diameter, or is it how massive it is? How much mass is packed inside that girth? And not only in which direction should we be discussing bigness, but then how much bigger does it need to be to provide that factor of 47?